So welcome to the U.S. Asia Law Institute's program. My name is Jose Alvarez. I'm the faculty director. Today's program is on negotiations for a new investment facilitation agreement for development at the WTO. I will introduce our two distinguished speakers shortly. But as is usual, I want to announce upcoming events at USALI. So next week is spring break here at NYU where our students just go to uh, points unknown. Uh, so we will not have a program, but we will make up for it with uh, a number of very exciting Gillette Dialogue programs, uh, all starting on Wednesday, March 23rd, March 24th, and March 25th, that whole week, uh, three programs in consecutive order. And then the following Wednesday, March 30th, the theme is climate change in Asia Pacific. It will include individual panels uh, on climate governance and the rule of law, rising sea level uh, issues in the Asia Pacific region, the US-Japan partnership on climate change and corporate governance issues involving climate change. It's thanks to our incredible leadership of Catherine Wilhelm that we have these exciting programs. I hope you will turn in, uh, tune in. If you want further details, they will be up shortly on our website. Look for upcoming programs. Uh, and I thank you uh, for tuning in for today. So today it's on investment facilitation. We have uh, two people who are really experts on this, at least one of them, my old friend Carl, has probably been working on this longer than I was born. <laughs> well, not quite, but maybe a, a dozen years at least. Uh, so our first speaker will be Kai uh, tomorrow. He is the second secretary at the Permanent Mission of Japan to international organizations in Geneva. And he works on the areas of trade, investment, and development uh, with the World Trade Organization and the International Trade Center. He's also served in the first North American division of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Japan, covering political relations between Japan and the US. He holds a master's degree in public policy from the University of California in Los Angeles and a bachelor's degree in North American studies from the University of Tokyo. His interlocutor, and he will address specifically at the start of his remarks, sustainable development questions, uh, arising from uh, this uh, possible agreement is Carl Savant, who is the resident senior fellow at the Columbia Center on Sustainable Development. He's a lecturer in law at Columbia Law School, where he teaches foreign direct investment and public policy. Uh, Carl was uh, the founding executive director of the Valley Columbia Center on Sustainable Development, the predecessor of the Sustainable Development Center today. He's published widely in the international investment area. He served as director of the UN Conference on Trade and Development's Investment Division. He joined the UN in 1973, creating the prestigious annual World Investment Reports, well known in the field. Uh, he served as lead author of those reports until 2004. He's the founder and now the editor until 2005, at least, of the journal Transnational Corporations. And he's provided leadership to no less than 25 monographs on key issues relating to international investment agreements. So I turn it to you, uh, Mr. Tamara, to start us off to introduce what this agreement is all about. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Alvarez, for the introduction. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kei Tomaru. I am a second secretary at the Mission of Japan here in Geneva. It is a great pleasure for me to be invited to this talk series together with Dr. Sobant. Um, I have been engaging in work and negotiations at the WTO for the past few years as a Japanese diplomat. Um, my goal for today is to share some ideas on what negotiations are going on and how it is proceeding in the area of investment at the WTO. So, and let me point out that I will speak in my personal capacity today. So let me share my screen. Okay, so in this presentation, I will discuss three points. First, I will cover the background and current status of the negotiations. And then I will share some perspectives from Japan on the negotiations. 
and then I will briefly touch upon the future path for the negotiations. So let me start with the background of the IFD initiative. IFD, it means uh, Investment Facilitation for Development. Um, so the IFD initiative was launched in December 2017 at the 11th Ministerial Conference of the WTO or MC11 held in Buenos Aires. Ministers of 70 WTO members agreed on a joint statement, which you can see on the right side. And with this joint statement, members started structured discussions on investment facilitation for development to see what elements could be covered in the future agreement. And in November 2019 in Shanghai, ministers of members agreed on another joint statement. And with this joint statement, members showed com commitment to intensify work on developing an actual agreement of IFD. And after around a year, in September 2020, members formally launched negotiations on IFD and started negotiations based on a consolidated text. The consolidated text means a set of provisions provide, proposed by members for the future agreement. So now let me turn to the current negotiations. First, who are in the negotiations? So the coordinator of the current negotiations is Mr. Franke, the Chilean ambassador to the WTO. There are currently 130 members in the negotiations, which includes EU, Brazil, China, Japan, and so on. And it is promoted by both developed and developing countries. The active members including, as I said, EU, Japan, China, Korea, Nigeria, Central Russia, and so on. So it is very diverse in terms of its development levels and also geographical areas. And how are we negotiating currently? So this year we have held monthly negotiation meetings where we, we consider the entire text and discuss some priority issues in the text. And we also discuss as a discussion group where we focus more on some specific topics which requires deeper deliberation. And because of the COVID-19 pandemic, we, most negotiation meetings are held in hybrid format of in-person and online. And this allows capital-based negotiators to join meeting remotely. Uh, let me briefly talk about uh, what will be included in the IFD agreement. So the main purpose of the IFD agreement is to facilitate foreign direct investment. So let me give you an example. Um, imagine a Japanese automobile company wants to expand its business to Africa and intends to establish a branch in some African country. And in this case, possible obstacles the Japanese company could face is that is limited access to information of regulations set by the host country and also painstaking process of authorization to get an approval of establishing the branch in the country. So the IFD agreement would increase the transparency of measures set by host countries, by, for example, by using online websites. And also the agreement would speed up and streamline authorization procedures by setting up some global standard and also the agreement tries to enhance international cooperation by increasing the information exchange and experience sharing related to investment among members. We are also discussing possible means to encourage sustainable investment 
this can include some measures to encourage responsible business conduct and combat corruption. The future agreement could also provide some development aspect of the investment, and this could provide special and differential treatment to developing countries. So for some developing countries, it is not easy to promptly implement the new rules under the IFD agreement. So for these countries, they can have some grace period before the implementation of some provisions, and also they could receive some technical assistance from other members. So this is a part of international cooperation to develop the investment environment. As a side note, the IFD agreement does not cover the issue of market access on investment protection and also interstate dispute settlement, as members agreed at the outset of the work. So next, let me turn to some perspectives from Japan. And I will focus on three points here. So for the first point, the IFD agreement can be an first inclusive agreement on investment facilitation. As you can see on the left map, this shows participating countries in the IFD, which is currently 113 members. And as you can see, it is very diverse in terms of its geographical areas. And on the right map, you can see countries where Japan has or will have bilateral or regional investment agreements, including investment chapters in EPAs and FDAs. And the existing investment agreements, whether it is effective or not yet, covers 78 countries and region, regions for now. So when you compare these two maps, for Japan, the IFD would be the first agreement on investment facilitation with around 50 countries currently participating in the negotiations. This includes Brazil, Nigeria, Norway, and so on. So with these countries in particular, we think that the IFD agreement would help facilitate investments for indirect investments, I believe. For the second point, the IFD agreement would also help con contribution to fostering the investment environment globally. In Japan, the JETRO or Japan External Trade Organization is a focal point of foreign direct investments into Japan. The JETRO has provided a wide range of assistances to foreign investors. This includes Invest Japan website and offices. And in the Invest Japan website, for investors can easily get access to investment related information, such as me measures set by Japanese government or incentives provided by them. And the website also offers opportunity of online consultations for, for investors and the Invest Japan offices, if necessary, connect for investors to other relevant agencies and local businesses. IFD would enhance international cooperation, including experience sharing and technical assistance among members, and it fosters a better invest in investment environment. And we believe that Japan can contribute to this based on these past and current experiences. For the side far point, the I, promoting the IFD agreement negotiations can also help revitalize the rulemaking function of the WTO. As you may know, the WTO has three main functions. They are rulemaking function, monitoring and deliberation of the WTO agreement, and also dispute settlement based on the WTO agreement. 
in terms of rulemaking function, traditionally WTO members has taken multilateral process. It, under the multilateral process, all members, which is currently 164 members, need to agree on the agenda to, to work in the future, and then they will work or negotiate on the agenda to reach for the multilateral outcome. However, it is not easy for members to proceed or carry out the outcomes under this multilateral process because of the difference of policy priorities or development levels among members. So at MC11 in 2017, a group of members sought for a new way of rulemaking process, which is plurilateral process. In this context, plurilateral as opposed to multilateral means a group of members instead of all members. So under the plurilateral process, a group of members, like-minded members, agree on a joint statement to start work on some specific topics and they will negotiate on the topic while expanding its membership with an aim to reach um, multilateral outcome. And I, IFD was one of the four plurilateral initiatives which was launched at the MC11 in 2017. So we believe that promoting the IFD negotiations as well as e-commerce and other plurilateral processes, we can revitalize the rulemaking function of the WTO. Lastly, let me briefly touch upon some prospects of IFD negotiations. In December 2021, last year, 111 participating members issued a joint statement where we took stock of the progress of the negotiations. And we also set a target of the negotiations, which is we aim to conclude the text negotiations by the end of this year. And WTO members recently agreed on a schedule of the MC12. The MC12 is currently scheduled for the mid-June this year in around three months. So the MC12 could be a place where the IFD negotiations gain more political push from ministers toward the conclusion of the text negotiations by the end of this year. With this time frame in mind, we will continue to actively engage in these negotiations. Thank you for your attention and uh, I welcome any comments or questions later. Thank you. So at this point, we'll hear from uh, Carl Savant who will tee up the sustainable development issues that are implicated by this. In the meantime, I welcome all participants uh, to start writing questions if they have some on the Q&A box. And between uh, myself and Carl, we'll uh, attempt to pose them to the participants. So Carl, it's your turn. Thanks a lot, uh, Jose, and uh, good day uh, to everyone. Um, I'm I just want to talk very briefly about the sustainable development dimension of the agreement. Of course, the negotiations are still ongoing, the text, but the text is stabilized, at least in many of the technical uh, parts of the draft agreement. So we ought to be able to say a few words. So let me just very briefly mention a few of these sustainability uh, development aspects. Um, like the Marrakesh Agreement itself, the preamble talks about or refers to sustainable development, but it goes further. The draft agreement goes further in that it also uh, talks about sustainable development in the text. And most importantly, it has actually a section identified as or, or titled sustainable investment. And I think this is the first time 
but uh, Jose, uh, please correct me. I think it's the first time that an international investment agreement would refer to sustainable development. And that particular section, and Kai has already made reference to it, uh, at the moment uh, includes uh, a provision that asks uh, 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 multinational enterprises, in other words, international investors, to voluntarily incorporate uh, responsible business conduct practices in their uh, practices, in their strategies, and also to undertake uh, meaningful engagement and dialogue with stakeholders, and also to undertake due diligence exercises in reference to their investments. And again, I think this uh, provision uh, to refer to stakeholder interaction and due diligence um, is something which is not very common if it exists at all in other agreements. There is also a proposal uh, that uh, would provide not only for host countries to facilitate investment, but also for home countries to facilitate investment. As Kai pointed out, the purpose of the agreement is to facilitate investment, and I would say in particular sustainable foreign direct investment. And of course, facilitation can be done by the host country, but it also can be done by the home country. And in fact, when it comes to sustainable FDI, the home country is in a stronger position, for instance, to request that uh, sustainable uh, uh, sustainable development impact studies or social impact studies are being undertaken by its investors investing abroad. So this is a potentially very important uh, clause. And it's also important because it would introduce a, an element of balance into the agreement. In other words, obligations to facilitate investment would not only be taken on by host countries, but also home countries. And finally, there is the question of uh, special and differential treatment, uh, technical assistance and capacity building, and Kai has <clears throat> already referred to that. So I think overall, that's quite an achievement. But of course, more could be done, and the negotiations are still ongoing. So let me just mention three very specific items. On responsible business conduct, one could perhaps strengthen the language by asking uh, members not only to encourage uh, their investors to incorporate responsible business practices or conduct, but actually to observe these responsible business conduct uh, principles as laid out in various international agreements. So it would be one way to strengthen the agreement. Another one is, and this is after all the core of the agreement, is to strengthen uh, and to introduce and include specific technical measures. After all, it's all about specific technical measures to facilitate investment, not only in terms of increasing investment flows, which in turn then contribute to the development, but also make a direct contribution to the economic development of host countries. And I'm thinking here in particular about supplier development programs, because supplier development programs allow multinationals and their foreign affiliates to source locally if they want to, but it at the same time strengthens the domestic enterprise uh, sector by helping domestic firms to be upgraded, to be able to become competitive suppliers to multinationals. So that would be you know, a very concrete measure that I think would increase the development impact of investment facilitation. And then finally, and Kai has also made reference to it, there, is a commitment to provide technical assistance and capacity building. And of course, that is absolutely important in particular for the least developed countries because the agreement is only useful if you can implement it fully 
And we know that most, many developing countries and certainly virtually all least developed countries don't simply have the resources to do that. So technical assistance and capacity building are key. And that brings me to my first question to Kai immediately. Uh, what do you expect that members will do in this respect? Will they make a stronger commitment to capacity building and technical assistance, perhaps even by providing for the establishment of a trust fund uh, to finance technical assistance and capacity building, and specifically considering that Japan is a very rich country, is Japan likely to contribute to such a trust fund and to such efforts of technical assistance and capacity building? Kai. Thank you for your question, Dr. Servant. So for the technical assistance and capacity building under the IFD, first of all, the SNDT, which I explained in the presentation, special on differential treatment to developing members under the IFD, currently it is considered based on the model taken by the Trade Facilitation Agreement or TFA. In the Trade Facilitation Agreement, uh, the SNDT provided uh, based on the categorization of pro provisions. So developing members self-designate uh, the necess necessity of the, uh, receiving technical assistance over a grace period for before the implementation of the new rules under the new agreement. So <clears throat> Based on the categorization of the provisions, we think that we can provide necessary assistance, technical assistance or capacity building based on specific provisions to necessary members. And as for Japan, we have also contributed to uh, technical assistance and capacity building uh, in, in many aspects, including the for the implementation of trade facilitation agreement. And also, for example, this month, we contributed additional financial fund to WTO Global Trust Fund, which provides capacity building assistance to developing countries officials and also contributed to uh, International Trade Center where they provide technical assistance to improve trade capacity, trade related capacity of developing countries. So when it comes to the technical assistance and capacity building under the IFD, the this is a topic we will further discuss under the negotiation, and we will uh, seriously consider this uh, topic as well further. Thank you. It's uh, encouraging to hear uh, because uh, we know that we know we don't know, but we can expect that the implementation of an investment facilitation agreement is likely to be more difficult and more expensive than the implementation of the trade facilitation agreement. So uh, this will be an important question. But I, I should actually have started to ask you something which is much more basic, namely when it relates to the beginning. Um, you mentioned that 113 countries are supporting uh, the negotiations. That leaves quite a number of other countries that are not supporting it. And if I understand it correctly, at least uh, India and South Africa are sitting on the fence or are against it. Uh, why? Why are some countries not supporting it? They're all, every country is seeking to attract foreign direct investment, right? Without exception, every single country. So why are they not supporting 
why are not all part of the negotiation and why are some against it? Okay, thank you for that good question. So at the WTO, as I briefly touched upon in my presentation, WTO members have taken a multilateral process traditionally and under the multilateral process, uh, all members need to agree on the agenda to work on first and then work or negotiate on the agenda later. So I understand that there are some members who would like to focus our work on the uh, areas which are mandated by all members. They include agriculture, development, and so on. And uh, on the other hand, as I explained, uh, as the global economy is changing rapidly, there are more and more emerging issues for which we need new rules. And we, so we believe that the multi, a plurilateral process is another way to make new rules and at the WTO. And uh, so they, the multilateral process and plurilateral process are not substitutes, but they are complementary with each other. And so we believe that both of the process and the areas to be covered for the both process are mutually uh, important. And uh, so we will uh, work, actively work on both processes. And I could imagine that um, in particular for the least developed countries or, or most of them to participate actively in the negotiations is not that easy because they have very limited staff and lots of things ongoing in the WTO. So they may not be participate actively, but it brings me to another question, the landing zone, so to speak. If it is a plurilateral, in the, if you are said you are aiming for a multilateral agreement, meaning all 164 members uh, support it. Now, if they don't do it, it's a plurilateral as you explained, but how could it be incorporated then in the rule book of the WTO? Because if some are not part of it or against, how can it become a WTO agreement which requires unanimous approval? Mm. Thank you for another great question. So we, we are aiming to reach a multilateral outcome, first of all. And if, but at the same time, we are also seeing some possibility of having a plurilateral outcome. And how, if so, how we are also discussing how to incorporate it under the WTO agreement. And there are a couple of options we are considering for now. And uh, it, it can be a very technical, legal uh, discussion, but under the WTO, there is a, a annex called Annex 4, which holds all plurilateral agreements. And also for the Annex 1, um, it's a <clears throat> multilateral outcomes to be praised, but uh, there are some ways for all members which uh, accept or not accept the agreements set in the Annex 1. So we are seeing some possibilities of uh, uh, having the plurilateral outcome uh, in the under the Annex 4, or more aiming to uh, have a multilateral outcome in a way that some members would not accept it under the Annex 1. So these are the uh, discussions we are having internally and also at the WTO among members. Since you're sharing already some information about the internal discussions, can you also tell us whether 
the option of having a standalone agreement is being considered. Hmm. When you say standalone, it is outside the WTO or? Right. Um, uh, no, I, I, I don't think we are uh, considering a standing alone uh, agreement, I mean, outside the WTO. We are always trying to have an agreement at the WTO, under the WTO agreement. That's the aim of this negotiation. Mm. And as you said, it's, it, it's part of an effort to revitalize the WTO and of course, an agreement in any of those uh, joint uh, statement uh, initiatives would, would contribute to that. Um, we are here in the US, at least uh, Jose and myself are in the US. The obvious question is, the US is not um, a signatory to the joint statement. But the US has a history of being very active in international investment rulemaking and a leader in it in many respects. How come it is sitting on the sidelines? Okay, so I'm not in a position to express the views from the US government. Fair enough. But yeah, um, participating members in the FD have been actively reaching out to non participants and, call, and calling for their participation in the IFD. So we, we hope more members, including the US, will join the IFD negotiation soon as we approach the conclusion of text negotiations targeted by the end of this year. And uh, we also saw that the fact that the US joined the service domestic regulation and negotiations as another pre-data initiative last July, we saw it as a very good signal or move of the US government. And uh, having that uh, momentum, we successfully agreed uh, on the text negotiations of the service DL. And the US is also one of the most active members in e-commerce negotiations, which is also another prioritary initiative. And as for investment facilitation for development for Japan, as I explained in my initial presentation, the IFD agreement is beneficial for uh, us uh, to have first inclusive agreements on investment facilitation, especially with uh, those who we haven't had any investment related agreements. And also it uh, will help revitalize the rulemaking function of the WTO entirely. So uh, these are merits. Uh, we feel for Japan, and this can be transferable to other members, I believe. Uh, that actually raises a, an even more basic question. You, as you said, this would be the first multilateral agreement um, on investment. Um, and of course, as you pointed out, it would be focused entirely on technical matters and the the more controversial issues like uh, protection, market access, and investment dispute settlement uh, are excluded. And there was actually a question in that respect uh, to the in the chat box. Uh, these three invest, uh, investor state dispute is excluded from the negotiations. But the more basic question then is, why why do we need? What would be the advantage? What would be the value added? of a multilateral agreement. After all, individual countries, as, as we said earlier, are all attracting investment. They're all facilitating investment. Um, you also have investment facilitation provisions now in, in bilateral agreements, in regional agreements. In fact, the EU has started to negotiate bilateral investment facilitation 
uh, a, a bilateral investment facilitation agreement with Angola, and I'm sure it will negotiate similar agreements with other countries. So why, what would be the value added of a multilateral agreement? Thank you for the question. So the IFD agreement and other international investment agreements are complementary to each other, I believe. So for the IFD agreements, we focus on the investment facilitation measures and it doesn't cover market access, investment protection or uh, ISDS issues there, which can be covered by uh, other international investment agreements. And as for the investment facilitation measures, if IFD can provide more ambitious provisions than other international investment agreements, this can be additional values uh, on this point. And also in terms of geographical uh, areas, the IFD covers uh, much wider countries and regions under the uh, agreement compared to other bilateral or regional agreements. And uh, this, this helps countries to cooperate internationally in a more global, global scale. So as I briefly touched upon, uh, we are also aiming to enhance international cooperation by information exchange and experience sharing among members. I mean, related to investment measures. So this will be the additional value of the IFD. So it's uh, partly an efficiency argument it's better to have a multilateral agreement as, as sort of as a what as a commitment device uh, for countries that uh, also want to undertake reforms and uh, can refer them to a multilateral agreement to um, as a reference point of best practice uh, what is possible including i suppose in order to overcome any domestic opposition to um, facilitate foreign investment. Um, but, you know, I think this makes it all the more important that the technical assistance and capacity building provisions are, are very, uh, are strong enough, so to speak, uh, to really make sure that uh, particularly the least developed countries can benefit from the agreement. Uh, but when we talk about a multilateral agreement, why the WTO? After all, UNCTAD, for example, has much more experience and with uh, dealing with foreign direct investment. So does the World Bank, so does the OECD and UNIDO. Why the WTO? Mm. Mm. First of all, WTO has three main functions and one of which is a rule making function. So members uh, uh, work on updating rules necessary for the current international economy environment. And uh, investment is uh, very much integrated to the trade issues as well. So traditionally WTO deals with uh, trade rules but uh, in investment is also uh, something very much ready to trade. And so we, we are having more and more necessity to have uh, global multilateral or plurilateral rules on investment. And uh, as you know, Geneva or the WTO is a place where uh, we are working uh, all, uh, many of the uh, countries, most of the countries are uh, gathering and it is efficient for us to work on the issues of investments as well as trade in at the WTO in Geneva. Um, if I may 
turn to some of the questions in the chat box and the Q and A, uh, and getting away from the more general issues which we have discussed. <clears throat> There's a very specific question: Is there language in the draft addressing climate change, either encouraging or mandating compliance with any specific rules or guidelines for using green technology, disclosing climate risks? and so on hmm. okay so this is uh the negotiation is still ongoing as you know so uh i cannot say anything specific but on as part of uh, responsible business conduct the aspect of environment could be uh, potentially one aspect which um, uh, the government could uh, promote. So, um, yes, this is not only the environmental aspect, but also social aspect in investing into another, other countries. You, <clears throat> you mentioned a question which links directly to what we just discussed, or to the question which was raised. <clears throat> You mentioned uh, in your introductory remarks that uh, one of the key issues <clears throat> in the agreement is transparency. Transparency of investment uh, regulations. Speaking about transparency, the draft text is not available to the public. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't it be an exercise in transparency to make that draft text available and perhaps even invite comments on it. After all, there may be groups in civil society starting with business, but also NGOs and trade unions and consumers who might be able to make some concrete input into this. So my concrete question is, will, what is your estimation? Will the text be made public? And would Japan argue for making it public? So, as for the text making it public, um, we understand the merit of uh, publicizing the text, as you mentioned. Uh, on the other hand, um, customary uh, diplomatic negotiations. Uh, is uh, based on the mutual trust among members and uh, the for at least for certain period, the text of the uh, of the negotiations is uh, confidential uh, to the public. So uh, we need to carefully consider uh, whether to make it public or not, uh, taking account these points as well, I think. Well, as you said, it's customary that texts are not public. It's also mm -hmm. customary that investment is not being negotiated in the WTO. So some customs are being broken, not broken, are being developed. Uh, and maybe the same can be done with transparency. I think it's something that uh, your colleagues may want to consider uh, in due course. Let me return to... <clears throat> to some of the questions in the Q&A box. Um, there's a question about, uh, are, there, are there any safeguards in the agreement against corruption or other diversion of investment funds? Um, from what I understand, there is corruption is being addressed under, under uh, sustainable investment, but maybe you can tell us a little bit more. Mm -hmm. So corruption issues is also discussed under the category of responsible business conduct at the IFD and uh, um, combating uh, corruption uh, along with uh, uh, other international uh, instruments set by other international fora like UN or OECD would be beneficial, I believe. So. I believe that promoting responsible business conduct, including combating anti-corruption, uh, will be a, another additional value that uh, the IFD could provide 
at the WTO. That's a new aspect at the WTO. In any case, uh, the OECD Convention on, on, on Corruption, so the issue mm -hmm. has been comprehensively addressed elsewhere. Uh, staying with uh, sustainable investment, <clears throat> a question here in the Q&A box, um, it's a very important one and a difficult one. Um, if we, if we want sustainable investment, how do we distinguish between sustainable investment and not non-sustainable investment? And would there be any positive incentives for sustainable investment? And of course, negative incentives for other investment. And what's the role of home countries in this respect? Let's keep the home country part aside. So the question is, if we talk about sustainable investment, um, how do you differentiate it from non-sustainable investment? Mm. So under the IFD, the differentiation between investment, sustainable investment or a non-sustainable investment is not a aim, but uh, the aim of the IFD is to promote the sustainable investments along, in my understanding, along with the other international ins instruments set by uh, other international organizations, which uh, has certain um, standards um, for the sustainable investment. So uh, we hope that uh, we can promote the uh, sustainable investments also like pu pushing additional uh, making additional push by the IFD along with other uh, instruments set by other international organizations. If I understand correctly um, the agreement actually the draft agreement actually starts by emphasizing that uh, foreign direct investment can make a contribution to sustainable development um, and I guess the issue of, so all foreign direct investment on balance uh, is expected to make a contribution to development. But I guess the issue when talking about sustainable investment is whether more could be done in order to increase the contribution that investment can, can make to do, uh, development, be it in terms of technology transfer or uh, um, engaging in green investment or what have you. And I think to a certain extent, perhaps also the precedent sent, set by the, um, by the trade facilitation agreement, which talks about an authorized operator uh, is relevant here because it basically says if an operator, in this case, a trader is particularly uh, meets certain criteria then it has it gets additional facilitation measures, and perhaps one could think about something similar in the context of the investment facilitation agreement, by having, for instance, a recognized sustainable investor who would get additional incentives in return for additional facilitation measures, and that brings me back to the question of home country measures, which is also part. Of, um, of the question which I'm looking at. Um, as, as we said before, facilitation can be done by host countries, it can also be done by home countries. And then from what I understand, there is a proposal to include home country measures. What is your assessment of uh, some obligations for home countries to facilitate investment? And what's Japan's position on it? Okay, thanks for the question. So as for the home country measures, it is generally placed under the category of investment promotion rather than investment facilitation in other investment agreements, at least Japan already has. And uh, so this is a matter of the a scope of the IFD agreement, I believe. And so if we would like to have uh, 
home state uh, aspect of the promotion or facilitation of investments, we need to carefully consider the scope of the IFD. Uh, nevertheless, Japan uh, recognizes the importance of the home state uh, role of promoting investments. And uh, the JETRO, which I mentioned in my presentation, has provided extensive assistance to Japanese investors investing in other countries. And uh, for example, the JETRO has a lot of local offices in Asia, Europe, and also the US. And the, the offices provide uh, assistance in terms of information and also um, connection to, um, to relevant agencies or local businesses uh, helping uh, Japanese investors investing in these countries. So yes, we will continue to provide this assistance from the perspective of our home country as well. So if uh, Japan is already facilitating uh, investment in its capacity uh, as a home country, I deduct from there that uh, Japan shouldn't have any problems uh, to accept an obligation in that direction. But I'm not asking you to comment on that, <laughs> just drawing some conclusions. Um, one final question before we come to the end, um, question of dispute settlement. Obviously, as in any dispute, uh, in, in any agreement uh, done by the WTO or any other context, dispute settlement is, a, is an issue. What is foreseen there? Hmm. Um, so we are also discussing the issue of dispute settlement under the IFD. And uh, if we successfully incorporate the IFD in, under the WTO agreements, uh, uh, using the traditional customary settlement under the WTO uh, is one of the uh, options for the IFD agreement as well. And yes, that's my answer. And from what I understand, there is a provision that seeks to insulate uh, the uh, investment facilitation for mm -hmm. development agreement from the ISDS provisions in, in other uh, disputes. Well, um, let, me, let me conclude uh, with a final question. Jose, I, I would like to see whether Kai might have any final observation um, before returning to you, Jose. Okay, so as for the uh, IFD negotiations, uh, as I mentioned, we have set a target of concluding the text-based negotiations by the end of this year. And we have seen a lot of convergence of members in many of the core uh, provisions in the future agreements. And we are currently discussing some of the uh, priority issues, including the scope of the application of the uh, provisions under the IFD. And uh, despite the difficulty we are facing right now, we will uh, actively further contribute to these negotiations. So thank you for today. Thank you. Jose. Well, thank you both for uh, intriguing uh, conversation. Uh, there are many, many, many other issues, uh, some of which were teed up a little bit in the, in the box. I am intrigued by the attempt to exclude this from the ISDS because under some definitions of fair and equitable treatment, some definitions of most favored nation treatment, you could imagine an investor uh, under those agreements trying to reach into any obligations uh, here that could benefit them, including for transparency, authorization, or otherwise. So I think that would be very important. From my own perspective, I think it is, uh, to me, uh, absolutely true 
uh, what UNCTAD has pointed out now for many years that we have uh, in 2014, back before COVID, they estimated a $2.5 trillion per year shortfall in foreign capital flows that would be needed to fulfill the SDGs. And we're talking comparable sums just to maintain greenhouse gas emissions at current levels uh, by 2030, something like $1.2 trillion just to increase FDI flows to make, uh, mitigate climate change alone, never mind now to prevent pandemics. So for me, uh, this should be on the agenda of every one of the institutions, including UNCTAD's working group three on reforming IIAs. In other words, this should be all hands on deck to make sure that sustainable capital flows uh, for sustainable development uh, flow to all the countries because this is a global issue, climate change, pandemic relief, just to name two. So foreign investment flows are vital. Uh, and it's not just a matter um, uh, of uh, protecting the WTO or helping it uh, increase. This is the substantive issue of protecting the planet and protecting people's health. So for me, it should be part of every agenda, including reforming investment agreements, regional agreements, UNCTAD's working group and so forth. Thank you for teeing up this uh, invaluable uh, program. And, uh, and hopefully we'll come back to it, uh, certainly by the end to see what you guys have produced. Uh, and thank you, um, uh, Kai, tomorrow for uh, telling us what Japan thinks. I think regrettably, I know what the Biden administration thinks, which is it's more important to make sure that everything is manufactured in the US. Uh, and therefore, that's what we heard from the State of the Union, I'm afraid. So uh, the U.S. is, uh, at least under this administration, perhaps likely to remain on the sidelines. And that's very, very regrettable uh, from my standpoint. But thank you both uh, for this wonderful conversation. Take care.